Now today's gospel and the readings have a lot of interesting points in them. And we're going to talk about the cross. And you know, the cross, of course, is the universal symbol for Christianity, for Christ. Now, if I was God, I'm not sure if I would use that. I think I'd probably have a recliner, you know, with a, with a pizza and a giant glass of orange crush, relaxing, you know, indulgence. But that's because I'm a sinful human being who has weakness like Peter. So what happens when Peter proposes that concept to our Lord? He gets in big trouble because Jesus gets through saying he's got to suffer greatly. And I've got those words there. See, on the back from Luke, it was necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory. And he calls us to carry our cross, see? It is necessary for us to undergo many hardships before we enter the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. So what happens after Jesus is talking about suffering? Peter, being a man like me, looking for the easy way out, says, you know, he began to rebuke him, you know, saying, you know, you should never suffer this. But what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking as God does, but as men do. So the thinking of the devil is obviously for us to devalue the cross. Get away from the cross. Suffering does you no good. Don't start thinking it has any value, like it might help purify you from sin. It might strengthen you. It might be a way to unite you to Christ, to prepare you for heaven, that the cross is the bridge from earth to heaven, that we look to Christ and what he suffered as our example to follow. The devil doesn't want us thinking that. He wants us to devalue the cross. What does St. Paul say? The cross is folly to those who are perishing. They see new, no value in it. So we need to see value in the cross. We need to understand it. And so um, the cross, basically, to understand what the cross is, we need to understand that it is a symbol for a reality that we and the whole world deals with on a regular basis. So for Christ, the cross was wood because he does not have the problem with sin that we do. But for us, it's a different matter. Our cross is not wood. Jesus says in the gospel, whoever wishes to come after me, see now Peter just got through saying, Jesus, you don't need to suffer. And then Jesus turns around and says, get behind me, Satan, that way of thinking against suffering. And then he says, not only am I gonna suffer, but if whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. What does he mean? In Luke, it even adds the word daily. So what is this cross that we have to carry if it's not made out of wood? It is any sacrifice involved in the service of God. So if we go to keep the commandments, especially the fifth and sixth commandment, which are the major subject of the news. And so the world is at war with the cross. What did the Pharisees say to Jesus? Come down from the cross and then we will believe. Because the world wants to separate Christ from the cross. They want to separate the reward of heaven from the sacrifice of the love of God and neighbor that is necessary to get there. In the imitation of Christ, it says to refuse the cross is to refuse heaven. So the world refuses the cross. It's at war with the cross. The world wants a life of all pleasure and no suffering. That's what the world wants, the eternal they want. Come down from the cross and then we will believe. In other words, give us a God of pleasure, not a God of suffering. We don't want that God of suffering. We don't like suffering. So to, what does Jesus say to them? He doesn't answer them verbally. He doesn't say, I'm not coming down from the cross. He answers them with his actions and he stays there until three o'clock, the hour of mercy, until he has completed the redemption of the world and suffered until he has died from basic exhaustion and loss of blood and whatever else is going on as he's being crucified. So Jesus gives us the per perfect example of persevering in the cross. So what does the world say? 
See, the world doesn't want inconvenience. And so, what does it want to do? The fifth commandment, thou shalt not murder. It's actually thou shalt not murder. People say thou shalt not kill, but you know, you can kill in defense of innocent life. But you cannot be an unjust aggressor who takes innocent life. And that's what the world wants to do. Look at the, look at um, euthanasia. Let's take the elderly and the sick. If, if, they're, if they're suffering, let's, let's kill them. We'll call it mercy. We don't have a right to take people's lives. Or on the other end, the most vulnerable, elderly, sick, and children in the womb. You know, oh, it's inconvenient that she's pregnant. Well, let's take care of it. You know, that's the fifth commandment. And so that is a rejection of the cross. It's saying we want to avoid responsibility for our actions. We want to avoid the message of sacrificial love as proclaimed by Christ on the cross. So if someone's sick or suffering or old or, or in the womb when we didn't plan it, let's kill them and call it mercy. It's not mercy, it's murder. And it's irresponsibility. And the same thing with the sixth commandment. Uh, let's attack the family and redefine it. The family is a man and a woman in marriage having children. Let's change it, let's attack it from every angle, chisel away at it, separate uh, the marital act from marriage. Let's change the order of man and woman. Let's, let's do everything we can to reject any kind of uh, Suffering, responsibility, or nat natural law given to us by God and the cross. It's a rejection of the cross. And that's why the world is on either side. You have Christ in the center, and you have the bad thief and the good thief. The bad thief is over there with anger. Because he's suffering and he doesn't like it, and he has, sees no value in it. He rejects God, he rejects the cross, he rejects sacrificial love of God and man. He only loves himself at the expense of neglect and exploitation of his neighbor and the honor of God. And so above him is Michael the Archangel with the sword of, of justice coming down, the scales are out of balance. On the other side of Christ on the cross is those who seek to follow him as disciples. Mike, uh, Gabriel, the angels blowing the trumpet, and this thief is, is saying to the other thief, he rebukes him. He says, have you no fear of God, seeing that we are under the same sentence? We're both dying on the cross. And he says, we are getting what we deserve. He's accepting responsibility. In other words, I'm suffering on the cross for the evil things I've done. He's humbly accepting his punishment. And then he proclaims the innocence of Christ to the bad thief. But this man has done nothing wrong. He's proclaiming the innocence of Christ. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, approaching him with faith. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. And so we see the acceptance of the cross is the key to getting into heaven. Now, we see in our readings, this first reading is beautiful. Um, think about it, Isaiah 50, chapter 50, written centuries before the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. And what do we see? The words are written like in the first person, as if we can get inside the mind of Christ. I have not rebelled, have not turned back, I gave my back to those who beat me. The scourging at the pillar prophesied. The second sorrowful mystery of the rosary. Jesus is saying, I'm accepting my suffering for the love of the sinners that I have been sent to save. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. I gave my back to those who beat my cheeks to those who plucked my beard. My face and I, I did not shield from buffets and spitting. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone's going to be spitting in my face and punching me in the face, I'm going to be hitting back really quick. It's not in my nature to just, you know, Christ did a very heroic thing there. Now, I would then at least try to shield myself, but Christ is not even shielding himself because he has been called to this suffering and he accepts it. Now. We all have different types of suffering we are called to. So I have three categories of the cross. 
There is the ordinary category, which is something that everybody is, deals with. You're, you're in a traffic jam, and it's aggravating for the next 10 minutes to an hour or whatever, how long, ever long you're stuck. I've been stuck, I remember in New Jersey, I was stuck in one for two hours on the, on the parkway coming home from Seton Hall from college, and I just couldn't take it anymore, and I didn't know where I was, but I said, you know, two hours, and we've gone like five miles. I'm getting off this thing. And I don't, so I managed to find, uh, I think, Route 35 or Route 1, and I knew that would take me home. I didn't have a map or anything. I just managed to make my way home, but I just, I can't take this anymore. So there's ordinary suffering that comes and goes that has no connection to really a sin that we committed. Now all suffering is ultimately connected to sin. It's either the sin of Adam and Eve, and that's why we have earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes, you know. History Channel has that series on natural disasters called the wrath of God. Why we have the wrath of God in nature? Because of the sin of man, of Adam and Eve in, in paradise. That's why we're thrown out of paradise and the world is no longer paradise. It has earthquakes and tsunamis and bad things and, and snakes and all these things, you know. It's part of the punishment. We are not in paradise. We need to struggle to get back to paradise. So it's the cross is a result of sin either of Adam and Eve the sin of something I have done, like if I start drinking too much and I have to struggle to overcome drinking, then I have to deal with the cross. I have to deal with withdraw and turning back on it. And, you know, the longer that we resist the cross when we're called to it, the bigger the cross gets. And it follows us. So if I'm going to keep saying no to God, I'm not going to stop drinking or whatever I'm doing, I'm not going to try to resist, I'm going to stay in habitual sin without making any effort to struggle to overcome it, it just, the cross just gets bigger and it follows us. The cross follows us from time into eternity. If we never accept the cross, when we get out of this world, it will be waiting for us and it will be big and scary and eternal. The crosses we suffer now are temporary as long as we accept them and turn towards the Lord and get with the program of the gospel of self-denial and take up your cross daily. But if we reject the cross and just seek to avoid it our whole lives, try to get as much pleasure and sin out of this world and avoid the cross as much as possible, the cross will be waiting for you when you get to the next world. Because, you know, the devil's like an evil used car salesman, you know. He gives you a deal and then you find out later that you've been uh, taken, lied to, made a fool. Because the deal that he gave you is a rotten deal. But the, God, the deal that God offers is up front. Okay, you're going to suffer first. And then you will join me in glory. Like the Amco Transmission Man. Remember that commercial? You can pay me now or you can pay me later. So his point was, you can pay me now and change your transmission fluid, or you can neglect to change your transmission fluid and have your transmission break down later and replace the whole transmission at a cost, you know, 10 times what it would have cost to change the fluid. Pay me now or pay me later, but you're going to pay. So the cross is there for the believers and unbelievers. That's why St. Peter says, the judgment of God's household has begun, uh, the judgment has begun with the people of God's own household. So if the good suffer like this, what will become of the ungodly? What does Jesus say in the middle of carrying the cross? He says to the women, weep not for me, but for yourselves and for your children. For if they do this when the wood is green, what happens when it is dry? Wood that is green means it has life in it. So the life of grace in Christ and in his followers. Wood that is dry can burn. You can't, if wood freshly cut, you cut a tree down that's still green, it won't burn. But if it's dry, oh yeah, it burns good. And so uh, we then are called to carry the cross. There's the ordinary ones. Then there's the ones, as I said, that we all have that are particular to us, that are a result of the, there, it's all a connection, the sin of Adam and Eve, our sins or the sins of our neighbor that come upon us. So there are crosses, ordinary crosses, major crosses, and super crosses. Most of us have to deal with a major cross in our lives somewhere along the line. What is, what is the cause of the major cross? It could be, again, uh, we've chosen an addiction, or we're dealing with some problem, some health problem, or we're dealing with a person that's difficult. It could be um, a family member that we're having trouble getting along with. It could be uh, um, someone at work or at school. 
So relationship problems, relationship crosses, there's all kinds of crosses, health, whatever, struggles with temptations to sin, dominant faults. So those are what I call the major crosses. So there's ordinary crosses that come and go. There's the major cross that we deal with throughout life. You may find you're confessing the same sins again and again, and that you're dealing with that is a cross. And then there's what I call the super cross. Those who have to deal with a major a major suffering like blindness or being crippled or being deaf or something in that category. And I believe those that carry that super cross will be given a super reward. Uh, we see up there, well done good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. Quote from Matthew. And so uh, the cross is something that we suffer without fully understanding, and that's part of the test of faith. We don't fully understand the value of the cross, but we know that Christ suffered. We know that he asked us if we're going to be his disciple to deny ourselves daily, take up the cross. And so there's a value there. We know that it helps purify us, it strengthens us, it prepares us for heaven, it unites us to God and separates us from sin, but still we don't understand fully the value. Now, something that's kind of interesting, the fact is the cross is faith in action. And I have to say, from a standpoint of logic and reason and from scripture, Martin Luther's theory of faith alone is to me virtually indefensible. When you look at this, the letter of James, it's a direct attack on his central core message of Father Martin Luther when he broke with the church. He says here, you know, and keep in mind that the examples that, that they're giving are different. James and Paul use different examples. Paul uses the example of works, meaning the works of the law, because the example he gives like 33 times in the first three or four chapters of Romans is circumcision. He's dealing with the ceremonial works of the law, which are to be rejected because we're entering the new covenant. He's not giving the example of the Ten Commandments and the works of mercy, which is what James is giving. He says here, if someone says he has faith but does not have work, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister has nothing to wear and no food for the day, so two of the corporal works of mercy that are in the judgment of Matthew 25, nothing to wear, in other words, to uh, clothe the naked, no food for the day, to feed the hungry, and one of you says to him, go, keep peace, be warm, eat well, but you don't give them the necessity of the body, what good is it? So faith itself, it does not have works, is dead. And so, you know, one time I had a, a Protestant minister in my office, and I tried to get an answer. I said, you know, I'm not trying to start an argument. I just want to ask calmly, there's something that bewilders me. How do you get your people to do something good if you tell them all they need is faith? What, what is it that keeps me from saying, well, I believe in Jesus, so I can go out and party all I want, and I can break every commandment without ever having to worry about it. I don't have to pray. I don't have to, I, as long as I believe in Jesus, I'm going to heaven. And he says, well, we say that, you know, if that you say you believe, but you don't act like you believe, then you don't really believe. I said, aren't you kind of saying the same thing we are from the other side of the table there? Doesn't it kind of come out, it sounds a little Catholic to me what you're saying. If you're saying faith plus something, right? And he said, well, I'll talk about it with you later. I got to get going. I got something. So he left. So in any event, I just don't see how that works out too good. But we see here, um, the idea is that, you know, when Paul is talking about justification, that's different. <coughs> There's nothing I can do to put myself in a state of justification. In other words, the atonement for all sin comes from Christ. That's justification. We can never justify ourselves. We can never do that which, which takes care of the justice that needs to be satisfied because of sin. Christ does that. That's why the scales of justice are out of balance over the bad thief. But once we've accepted Christ and received the benefit of the justification of his death on the cross, paying the debt for our sins, do we then, are we then free to just go back and live the same life? Or are we called to repent and change? When Jesus is asked, 
two different times in the Gospels. What must I do to enter into eternal life? One time he quotes the Ten Commandments, and another time he gives an example of the works of mercy. Connects with the cross perfectly. Basically he's saying, you got to carry your cross, resist temptation to sin, you got to carry your cross, persevere in prayer, one of the works of mercy, to pray for the living and the dead, to forgive all injuries, to bear wrongs patiently, one of my least favorite, um, to, you know, comfort the sorrowful, to uh, instruct those ignorant in the faith, to convert or admonish the sinner. You know, and, and all of these, this is how we carry the cross, the works of mercy and the commandments. And the world rejects both of them and attacks them in the news media constantly. So um, when, we, when we look at the, the teaching of James and we compare it to Paul, they're talking about two different things. Justification is what Christ did on the cross, and then salvation is something I work on with my free will, connecting myself to Christ. St. Paul, another thing Luther said, he's the first one to say it, once saved, always saved. And I have a problem with that because what does St. Paul say? Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. What does that mean? Wait a minute, I thought Jesus did everything. What do I got to work on? I got to work out my salvation? In fear and trembling, I thought, I'm sure I'm going to heaven. What have I got to fear and tremble about? St. Paul also says, I discipline my body, lest after preaching to others, I myself be lost. Wait a minute. I thought he's sure he's going to heaven. St. Paul, he's the one that they base the theory on. His writings, the one saved, always saved, is based on an interpretation of St. Paul. And he's saying that, you know, he's got to be disciplined, lest after preaching to others, I myself be lost. So how can he be sure he's saved? If St. Paul isn't sure he's saved, what makes Father Martin Luther think he's sure he's saved? Or anyone else who follows Luther's interpretation of the gospel? So there's some serious problems with that approach. So Jesus says, <laughs> you know, you cannot be my disciple unless you take up your cross, deny yourself daily, and follow me. The world says reject the cross and indulge yourself. Suffering has no value. Pleasure is the greatest good. Seek it always and seek to avoid any suffering. It has no value. That's the gospel of the world. That's why when Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, he meant Peter was espousing the philosophy of Satan, thinking as men do not as God does. The cross is what separates um, us from the world. The world is divided over the cross. Half of the world is over there with the bad thief, and the other half is with the good thief. We determine which side we want to be on. We see what the politicians, many of them, have chosen. They have chosen to reject the cross. They are at war with Christ and the cross and the gospel. We see the news media, the Hollywood movies, um, TV shows, all of it is basically a war on the cross of Christ and a war on the teachings of the Ten Commandments, the works of mercy, the gospel. So we are in a war, we are soldiers for Christ, we're in a battle. We determine which side we want to be on. And so um, Jesus showed us the way fearlessly. He says, I have, I have set my face like flint. Flint is a very hard stone. It's what you sharpen knives on. I have set my face like flint, Isaiah 50, knowing that I shall not be put to shame. He is near who upholds my right. Who disputes my right? Let that man confront me. See the Lord God is my help. Who will prove me wrong? Will we be able to prove God wrong on the day we stand before him? When Jesus shows us the incredible love he had, that he shed every drop of his precious blood on the cross in passionate love for each one of us, paying the debt for our sin. And so all he asks in return is that we ourselves take up our cross and follow him.